Okay, well, hi everyone, and I uh, hope you're all hope you're all set up and can and can hear us. Okay, uh, thanks very much for joining us on today's webinar, uh, where we're going to be covering the the subject of moving to Spain and, in particular, uh, gaining residency now and post transition, um, post Brexit. And uh, so, without without further ado, um, I want to uh, to let you know a little bit about myself uh, and what I do, and introduce you to uh, your panelists today. Um, well, well, my name is Paul Payne, and uh, I work for a company called Massa International, and we're a real estate company based on the Costa Blanca in southeast Spain. And essentially, I and my colleagues at Massa help people to to move to Spain to either buy a second home as a holiday home or to relocate permanently and I am based between the UK and Spain so I help clients out with information and planning of, of viewings and, and viewing trips uh, which we'll come on to in, in a bit um, and really manage the whole process from uh, answering questions, getting the right property information, accessing the market, recommending areas, and really pulling everything together for you and managing the whole process. And I do that in conjunction with 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 all my colleagues in head office and, and around our offices around Europe, and also our partners, uh, which I'm going to introduce you to uh, right now. Um, so I'm going to start off, uh, I want to introduce you to uh, Mike, uh, Mike Papa George, who works works with, well, I've worked with Mike for many years, know Mike for many years. Uh, well, good afternoon, Mike. Hey, Paul. So yeah, I'm Mike Papa George. Um, I help uh, Paul as a tech consultant uh, at Massa. So I help Paul try to help people uh, make, the choose, make the change to Spain. I've been here a little over 15 years and yeah, just working as a tech consultant, enjoying lifestyle here in Spain. Great, thanks Mike. And uh, hand up to Alex. Alex, uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Paul. Thank you for the kind invite. Yes, good afternoon everyone. My name is Alex Radford. I'm a, an English solicitor and a Spanish lawyer. My parents moved to Spain in 1981. Spain wasn't a member of the EU then. Uh, they joined in 1985. I grew up in Spain, returned to the UK in 92 where I studied law with uh, European legal systems and I returned to practice as a, as a lawyer in Spain in 2003. And I've been here ever since. Uh, my partner with my law in Spain, we have offices all across Spain, particularly of the Costa Blanca in La Zenia. And we act for clients buying property in Spain, selling property in Spain, and also inheriting property in Spain and its islands. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Uh, Robin, good afternoon. Yeah, hi, everyone. Thanks, Paul. Uh, so I'm Robin. I'm a director at A Place in the Sun Currency. Uh, we're a UK regulated currency specialist. And we're here as an alternative to your bank uh, to help you moving money to or from Spain. Uh, and making that whole process cheaper as well as easier. Um, and we've helped many people make the move to Spain. We only deal for people who are buying property. So uh, we, the whole service is very much geared up to those of you looking to make the move abroad. Thanks very much, Robin. Um, and now I'd like to introduce you to uh, Yvette and Mike. Um, Yvette and Mike, tell us a bit about yourselves and, and, and how we know each other. Hi, Paul. Yeah. Good afternoon, yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. We moved here eight years ago through Massa International, and that's when we met Paul. And we've kept in touch with Paul ever since because he's been such such a help to us. We both enjoy our life in Spain. Um, best move we've ever made. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so most definitely, you know, recommend it to anybody. And Massa International has been very good to us as well. Um, any problems we even now, if we still had a problem now, we'd still go back and ask Massa and they, and they usually help us. So, you know, yeah, well pleased, well pleased. Thanks, guys. Thank and, you. Uh, and uh, last but not least, uh, to Howard and June, or well, actually just, just Howard at the moment, it appears. <laughs> good afternoon. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Howard Davies. We moved here all oh, 2016 with help of Massa and Paul. Um, hopefully June will be joining us um, fairly shortly, but she's stuck at the dentist's. So this is my space at the moment. So hi everyone. 
Thanks very much. Thanks very much for that. So um, I'm going to get straight in with the, with the big subject that we want to talk about today, and that's and that's gaining residency. Um, so, Alex, I've got a, 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 a multi-parted question for you. Um, so do you want to get an idea? If somebody from the UK wants to take up residency in Spain during the transition period, which we're in now until the end of the year. What do they need to do? What needs to happen? by which dates and, and what are the advantages of doing that now as opposed to after that date? Okay, so yeah, big, big, big question, um, Paul. Yeah, we, we're acting for lots of clients, basically all over Spain, mainly British clients applying for residency. And basically, if someone is going to spend more than three months a year in Spain in a calendar year, because the, the tax year in Spain runs from the 1st of January to the 31st of December, and then they have an obligation to become a resident. And because we've got the, you know, the transition period ends on the 31st of December, if you're coming to Spain this year, there's a great advantage in obtaining residency this year, because this year, the requirements will, are less onerous than they may be next year. So, for example, um, if, you, if you apply for residency now, then typically across, remember, Spain's got 17 autonomous regions. We're really focusing today on, on the kind of Costa Blanca region, which is the Alicante province. You've got to prove that, and the, the, amount, the amounts have been varying, but on average, you've got to prove that you've got 9,000 euros in a bank account, so you've got to open a bank account. You've got to have an NIE number, which is a Spanish tax number, and you've either got to have a purchase of property or, or have a rental agreement for at least 12 months. So if it's, you know, Mr. and Mrs. over the age of 65, then they've got to have 18,000 euros in the bank account, and also they've got to prove income of about 800, 850 euros a month coming in. And that, th those funds have to be in place for up to three months before the application process. So you have got until the end of this year to apply for the residency. Um, you know, I would recommend that if you're here now or thinking about moving, I'd, I'd start the process as quickly as possible. So for example, we're opening bank accounts for clients at the moment, they're starting to put monies in. And if you're over the age of 65, then you can apply for form S1 from the UK and that will enable you to plug in to the Spanish healthcare system here. And, and once you become a resident, you're a resident for the next five years unless you leave and notify the authorities that you wish to leave. If you're under the age of 65, then you need to prove that you've got a um, healthcare policy in place to cover, to cover any accidents or incidents whilst you're here. And again, you know, once you've got that residency, it's, the Spanish government won't take it away from you. Next year, we expect, Paul, that the requirements will be harder to, um, to comply with. So, for example, the, the economic requirements might be, might, might be higher. So, for example, South Africans have to prove that they've got 24, 25,000 euros in the bank account, whereas now it's 9,000. So, so let's, let's wait and see if, if any changes, what, you know, what happens in the withdrawal agreement, if, if this point is specifically covered off. But by and large, we, you know, if you follow the UK press, the UK press is talking about allowing Europeans in if they got a, a job offer of about 20, with a minimum income of about 25,000 pounds. And Europe will reciprocate on that. So, so you know, we've watched this space, but basically, you know, if you can apply for residency this year, you're in a position to do so, I'd certainly recommend that people do that. Thanks very much, Alex. So we're gonna be coming back to you on, on uh, quite a few other points with regards to that shortly. Um, but I've, I've got a question for, for you, Robin. And um, that is, I've noticed, you know, particularly over the last year, there's been a lot of ups and downs with the, with the strength of the pound versus the euro. Um, and can, you, can you give us any insight into what's happening sort of right now and you know, what buyers can do to, you know, to give themselves the best chance of, of, of obtaining, you know, the best exchange rate? Possible. Uh, yeah, of course. Um, unfortunately, there's no no crystal ball to tell anyone what might happen over the next uh, next few months. Um, but you're absolutely right. It's been been extremely volatile for the last year. Really, we've had um, Brexit, general election. Things then started to look a little bit better at the beginning of this year. Rate was up. Everyone was starting to uh, be a bit happier about buying their euros. And then, of course, we've had the the COVID crisis uh, since, which has hit the UK uh, economy harder than, than the average European economies and, and therefore has, has hit the pound. So um, the highest rate we've seen uh, has been around 1.2 back in February and the lowest we saw was around 106 very briefly. And just to give people an idea, 
how much difference that makes um, on a typical 150,000 euro property. Uh, that's a difference of around £16,000 just in the difference on exchange rates in the last six months. Now, we hope next year won't be quite as volatile as that, and that certainly normally isn't. Uh, but we have got the transition period ending. We've got inevitably uh, government trying to negotiate last minute deals with, with Europe, which may or may not uh, happen. And then a big unknown as to what happens in January. So. Um, Although rates are quite low at the moment, uh, we're finding people are quite accepting of that because things may get worse. Um, there are bargains to be had in Spain post lockdown. There's, there's a lot of uh, people looking to get out now and buy. And, and I think the exchange rate actually has been a bit less of a worry than we thought for people in recent weeks. I think there's a, a general keenness to get on with it. Um, but certainly by using a currency broker instead of your bank, that can make you a, a decent saving on your exchange rate. Um, but yeah, the outlook is, is very, very hard to predict at the moment. And to be on the safe side, we, we've had quite a lot of people just getting it done, getting the euros bought uh, and getting on with it, quite honestly. Thanks very much, Robin. That's, that's great. And I know I've got a few more questions for you in a little while. Um, well, we've got quite a number of participants here today. Uh, it's been really, really well attended. So thanks very much, everyone, for, for, for showing up for today. Um, I'm going to ask you guys in the audience are going to put a little poll up here if you, so if you could actually uh, answer that'd be great give us an idea on on it's really interesting to know how how soon you're thinking of going to spain are these plans that you you brought forward that you really want to to make good now or are you planning uh, for in the future so let me just launch this poll and uh, i'm going to give that a, a few seconds for everyone to answer um, and it's uh, yeah, good, good to get a little test of, of, uh, of what the feeling is out there. And uh, wow, lots of responses coming in now. That's great. I'm going to let it run for a, for a few seconds more. Um, certainly, we've had inquiries and sort of anyone that I spoke to in the, in the industry seems to have almost record numbers of inquiries over the lockdown, which is, I guess, kind of understandable. People, people at home uh, watching a place in the sun and such and, and, and getting the idea to to get their plans uh, back on track i'm sure there's a bit of life is short in it too um so anyway let's have a look at this poll just end ending the poll now and uh let's have a look. i'm going to share the results with you now and uh quite even looking at that so we've got about a quarter of you looking to to get yourself a property before the end of september this year so that's very soon uh followed by uh just over a quarter before the end of this year so we look, half of you are looking to do something this year which is great and uh, 34 percent next year and uh and, and a few of you uh planning in really good time for a move uh, perhaps in a couple of years time so uh well thanks very much that's, re that's really interesting to know um and uh so that's a good a good talking point there and, and and i'm not surprised really that that kind of follows with the level of inquiries that, that we've been having um so now i am going to i'm going to just make sure we've shared that okay and i have got a question for howard <laughs> hi howard um now you've been in spain for what four years now over, yeah um can you tell us a bit about how the transition worked you're from from the uk to spain what um what were the sort of big differences that you noticed and, and you know, positives and perhaps some of the challenges that you faced um i think before we came out here we did quite a lot of research um on the internet looked into the different areas However, I don't think there's anything that really prepares you for moving here rather than being on holiday here. Uh, it's a very different experience. One of the first things I would say to anybody is everything will be familiar. Um, everything will seem a bit more comfortable. Most things are familiar, but the differences are what makes it interesting. So yeah, there are still supermarkets, pharmacies, etc. All works in pretty much the same way. Um, so that was part, one of the biggest parts of transition. Bureaucracy is quite interesting. Um, it seems to very much 
uh, depend on who's behind the desk on that day. Uh, so sometimes you walk into the same office, two different days, two different people, get a very different reaction. Um, and that takes some getting used to also moving from region to region. Um, so for instance, uh, changing a driving license. After you've been here for two years, you need to exchange your English or British license for a Spanish license. Uh, we initially applied uh, to go and take a test and make the change in Mercia. Uh, there was such a long delay for that to occur, we ended up going to Cartagena. So um, there are a few things like that. You may not always be, end up doing exactly what you thought you were doing, partly because it depends on who's on the desk on the day. Uh, the obvious one is driving on the other side of the road, uh, which June here, um, we've had some interesting experiences and anybody who's watching this is going to shock people. I have been round, around about the wrong way in Spain, but Paul was driving. That's not true. <laughs> <laughs> it may not be. Um, but yeah, overall, it, it's a fairly easy transition to make. Um, people ask about the language problems. There aren't really that many. Uh, if you're willing to learn a bit of Spanish um, or as much as you can, you will always find yourself trying to speak Spanish in restaurants or in the shops and you're nine times out of 10, they will reply in English. Um, and I think it's, it's just um, getting used to that kind of difference. Otherwise, very familiar, very much the same. and getting used to the climate and getting used to wearing t-shirt and shorts more than a suit and tie. Great. Thanks, Howard. That's, that's, a, that's a very good insight. Um, and it was true about the roundabout. Mm, I no, I've got a lawyer here, you don't forget. <laughs> okay, and now I have a question for Yvette and Mike. Um, and yet, yeah, we've known you guys for some time now. And I know that you guys are involved with all kinds of uh, activities within the community. Um, could, you, could you tell us a bit more about what your life looks like in Spain and, and what does that mean for you in terms of the activities that you do? I think we came here to retire and relax, but we're not retired and we're not relaxed really. <laughs> um, I started doing Zumba here and um, we wanted to raise money for children with special needs. So I approached the local bar and his, one of his relations works in a school in Torrevieja. So we approached the school and said, could we do just one, one lesson for the children? And they said, yes, come along, come and do it. Well, we're now on their curriculum. We've gone through all the police checks. So every Monday, not the moment, obviously, because it's too hot, we go every Monday and do an hour's well, two hours lessons, one for the adults and one for the younger children. And it is absolutely brilliant because their faces, you just can't capture it. And from that, we've actually ended up being involved in a protest march in Torrevieja because the government have been threatening to close down the schools for special needs children and put them in mainstream schools. So we went on to protest march for that. Um, we've also bought Father Christmas there at Christmas for them. So that's been just amazing and I, I love it to bits and I just, I can't imagine my life without that really. Um, and also if you, if you move here and you go to an urbanisation, you will find that you'll have a president for each part of your community. And I somehow volunteered to be vice president and now I'm president. So I look after my little part of the urbanisation, but now I'm also the well, they call it Presidents of Presidents, but I'm really the liaison between Low Crispin and Al Gorka Town Hall, which is how we built up a really good rapport with the Mayor there. So, for me, I don't really get much quiet time now. <laughs> well, you're a busy girl. I, know. I, I, I am. I, I, I follow your movements on Facebook and see you're always dancing or raising money or, yeah. or on a trip somewhere. Yeah. It's, uh, I, I, and Mike, I, I know in Mike we have... Uh, uh, an interest here, a shared interest that you uh, that you take take part in in Spain, right? Yeah, um, I run the walking football for um, this area, so that takes up two days a week, 
really running that. And I do little match reports, which really are little Mickey takes out of them all. And, but if I miss a report, then they do complain to me, where's our report this week? So, it's, uh, you know, that takes up a bit of time as well. And Yvette and I both also run the local cultural association. She is chairman of that as well. That's another one of her jobs. And I'm vice chairman. And through that, we organise um, many trips. We go away for two or three day trips, um, daily day trips we also do. Um, we also, in the local bars, we also organise sort of um, social evenings and try and raise a bit of money for charity in that in that way as well. So, yeah, it's, we, we love it here. It's very busy, but we, you know, we really enjoy it. Our time's well taken up. And we enjoy our time. We enjoy our time with what we do. So, and I would, would say one thing, though, I noticed on, I know I go on, Paul, but on your report that you just had in from people, where it says some people are thinking about next year buying. I must say that when we first got in touch with Massa, we was in touch with other agents as well. The other agents become a pet, whereas Massa didn't. Massa, I think we kept in touch with Paul at Massa for three years before we actually moved over here. And he gave us help, but he never pestered us. And that's one, one thing that I really, are thankful to Massa for. You know, all the other agents, we, we just dropped them because they become a mess. You know, they ask for your email or your phone number and they become a mess. So, yeah. So, well, that's to anyone that does move over. Well, that's all. I'm very happy to hear. <coughs> Can I just echo what Mike just said? Because we had the same experience, contacted lots of agents. The only person who came, kept on coming back to us over and over again was Paul. <laughs> I'm very grateful for it. Oh, that's, uh, that's 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 really really good feedback to hear. Um, and that's what I, Mike in a bit because I know you, you do all this exercise and and and, and powered as well. I mean, a lot a lot of people it's it's, it's well publicised. People say, oh, it's a much healthier way of living in Spain. Do, do you do you think that's do you think that's true? And perhaps if I ask uh, Howard first, what, what what do you think about that? Do you think it is a healthier lifestyle? It's on the crack of, crack of noon. Um, but no, we're up early most days. Jim and I are both involved in a local yoga studio. Um, I teach there. Um, Jim's involved in aerial yoga. But actually the diet is better. Almost definitely could say that. Um, just general lifestyle. It's more relaxing. But I would echo what Yvette and Mike said. Is you can be involved in so many things, or find yourself involved in things that you never anticipated. Um, and again, for me, it was the yoga was something I hadn't done for years, and um, now all of a sudden I'm teaching at a local studio. So yeah, it, it can be quite life changing. And the other one other thing I would say on that as well is for a lot of people who talk about oh, I'm going to do it next year, I'm going to do it next year, do it now. Um, We've had a few experiences over the past year, not myself and June personally, where friends have delayed and they weren't, they're now not around to regret it. So if you are going to do it, do it now. Well, that's that's uh, good advice, I would say. Well, that's, that's heavy, no, I know, but it is important. Okay. Well, thanks very much, guys. And, and uh, Yvette and Mike, do you, want, do you want to add anything to that at all? No. Um, Oh, sorry. No, I was gonna say I agree with Howard that um, the diet over here, it, you can make it a healthy life or an unhealthy life if you want to. But I mean, as far as even the air quality here is so much better, and you feel it in yourself even after I would say about six months from being here. It just it's hard to explain, but your body feels so much different, and the fact that you've got no stresses. I mean, over here, even if you're working, you don't get stressed because the Spanish are like. No, no, don't worry. You know, keep calm. It's not a problem. And it is very much like that here. All I can say, Paul, is look, 74 years old. It's not bad. Don't look it. See? No, you don't yeah. feel it. I certainly don't feel it. So. Glad, glad to hear it. Okay. Yeah. Thanks Paul very much. Paul doesn't look 74 either. 
um, so, so now I'm, I'm going to bring in uh, Mike. Uh, Mike, uh, and so you've you've got some questions that you've been looking at that are, that are coming to us pre during the registration period, um, and, and you're going to run through those. And then after we've had a number of questions come in on the Q and A now, um, and I'll try and deal with as many of those, or we will all try and deal with as many of those as we can after. Um, but yeah, handing over to you now, Mike. Okay. Yeah. Actually, Alex, this question is for you. Um, this came in earlier from Tracy. Um, she's asking, she would like to know if her partner moved to Spain and gained residency before Brexit, so before the transition period ended, would she be able to follow him and gain residency if she moved after, uh, after Brexit? And she was also asked about uh, capital gains implications. Okay, yeah, so, so ba basically the, the answer is, is yes. So long as he applies for and obtains residency this year, and they are of course married, um, so a spouse is a recognized person who could who could come as a beneficiary next year so they can certainly do that and the capital gains tax I imagine it's this one so the tax year in Spain runs from the 1st of January to the 31st of December if you moved out in September of this year then you don't become a Spanish tax resident in 2020 but if you would become a Spanish tax resident in 2021 and you'd submit your Spanish tax return in the year 2020 between May and June for 2021. And, that, and that's basically what most people would do if they're thinking about moving out. If you, if you moved out, um, say, it's not really gonna apply as much now, but pe people have asked me uh, this year, you know, I've sold my property in the UK, I sold it say, in February, and I moved out to Spain in March, and I became a resident. That actually means that they became a resident in 2020, and Spain could charge them capital gains tax on the sale of their UK property. So if you are planning the move, it's very important, I think, to, to become a tax resident after the year after you've sold your UK property. Um, so just bear that because you come out to Spain, you buy a property, and then if you sell a property in the UK, Spain will tax you on that. Okay. So just remember, if you're in, in Spain, you'll become a tax, Spanish tax resident after six months in a calendar year, and you'll be taxed in Spain on worldwide assets and income. Okay, thanks, Alex. Uh, some, some important information there. I was reading a bit about that this morning, actually. Um, Paul, we have a question that came in earlier from Craig. He's asking, how long does the process take from deciding on a property to completion of a sale? Okay. Um, so, if a property is existing, so if we're talking like a resale property or a new property that is ready to move into, um, we're usually working on the basis of about four to six weeks can be that can be made quicker if need be and it can be slowed down if, if need be from from the buyer um, if there's a, a mortgage involved in Spain maybe we need to allow a little bit more more time on that um, but a natural completion for a property that's existing for for us certainly is usually about four to six weeks um, that process seems very 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 quick and it is um we, we do a number of things perhaps a little differently to 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 some some property companies in that we collect in before we put a house on the market before we start to to, to show a property to anyone or arrange any viewings we actually collect in uh, all the documents that a lawyer such as alex uh, would would require and that's uh, and also make a number of checks that the lawyers such as Alex would would also make as well because we collect that in advance we can see uh, we can iron out anything that needs to be ironed out prior to, to starting to show a property so really once we find a buyer for a house it's it's, it's more or less as, as, as quick as, as the appointments can be arranged and the buyer can pay for the property um, would, would you add anything to that Alex no I, I think you're right I mean um... What, what, what kind of, it, it tends to act, you know, the, the, the buying process seems to go much faster than the UK. You know, as a UK solicitor, I act the clients buying property there and, and you get involved in chains and there doesn't seem to be as many chains in Spain. So, so that, that process, I think the buying process is certainly quicker, you know, anywhere between four and 12 weeks. If you've got a mortgage, uh, applying for mortgage, then that can take slightly, slightly longer. Um, but I think it's very important that you, you speak to the mortgage broker up front or a bank and get your mortgage offer before you come out to Spain. Um, certainly, so I'm no doubt Massa can help you with that, um, that process. 
Yeah, um, the only thing I would add to that is also we sell a lot of new properties. We sell new, new and resale properties. So we also sell a lot of new properties. So it's possible that you can have, for example, a villa built for you, uh, something built to order, or you're buying in a development that's still in, in construction. Um, so that is as long as is set out by, by the development. So if, if you were in Spain today, we were at a, at a development, and let's say you wanted to have a villa built for you, that's normally we work on 10 to 12 months for that that's all set out in the contract um and uh, th there's normally a, a small amount of delay built into the contract um so that, that the completion process can be longer if buying obviously something new and that's in construction but something that's that's key ready um or second hand property process is, is is pretty quick which is why we always suggest that you know don't rush to come over to Spain to look at houses in earnest until you've sold a property if it needs to be sold um, or you've arranged finances as, as, uh, as well, because you'll, you'll find that things move, move quite quickly there indeed. So I, I hope that answers, answers the question. Yeah, I think we got a few, a few answers depending on the situation there. That was actually quicker than I thought it would be. Um, Okay, so now we have a question. I know Howard and Yvette and Mike, I think you guys touched on this earlier. Um, Grace is asking, uh, I know very little Spanish. How much do you think this will be a problem for me when I move to Spain? You know, and just before I hand off to you guys, my experience when I came here, I did a year of Spanish in university, which means I knew no Spanish when I came here. And uh, it wasn't much of a problem for me. Certainly they enjoy seeing you make the effort and suffer when you're trying to order a coffee at eight in the morning for your first time. So you that Mike and Howard? Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I mean, um, when we first came in, neither of us spoke any Spanish at all. Um, I've since then, um, I started doing Duolingo, which was like a free app. Um, I now do Synergy Spanish, which I pay for. But at the end of the day, if, as long as you try to do a little bit of Spanish, they will help you to the end of the earth, but you know, it's just that showing that you're willing to try. If you go in somewhere, an official place and just start speaking English, then the shutters just go down and they don't want to know. If you just try a little bit, even if it's hola, just to say hello, then they know that you're making the effort and we've never had a problem, have we? No, no never. And I think politeness, if you learn the, the polite answers to them as well, you know, to say please and thank you and and excuse me, things like that, you know, I think they really appreciate that as well. But we've no, never had a problem no. language-wise. As Howard said as well, you, you can go into a restaurant and think, right, I'm going to do all my Spanish, and you do it all, and they'd say, okay, so you want steak and chips, and you want a Coca-Cola, and you think... Absolutely. I mean, that's exactly yeah. what our experience has been. Um, we spent quite a bit of time online Spanish courses. June still goes to Spanish lessons once a week locally. Um, I find it easier to learn online. I have a few stock phrases that have got me by. Um, one of which is necesito más lecciones en español, uh, which I use frequently. Um, one day I'll find out what it actually means in Spanish. But yeah, I, I think you will always get a, a positive response from them if you make a little bit of effort. But again, I'll echo what Yvette said. Sometimes if you go in, um, almost demands that they, they should speak English. Yeah, the shutters come down a little bit. Uh, but on the whole, Spanish, very friendly, very, very polite. They may not always do the please and thank you as much as we do in the UK. They seem a little bit surprised when we say thank you all the time. Um, but yeah, it's, it's generally a good experience. You'll get by with very little Spanish. Uh, but it's more fun if you're trying to learn and communicate in Spanish. I agree with that as well. Yeah. The first, first thing that Yvette ever learned in Spanish was to ask for a decaffeinated coffee. Uh, very important. Very important. And Paul, Paul, I remember perhaps that was because of Julia that used to work with Paul and she always drank the decaffeinated coffee. And so she talked that. That's the first thing she talked to me about straight away. And so always use that. 
We're good at coffee at NASA, yeah. That's that's yeah. Uh, that's that's our specialised subject. We we all we all run on on coffee, but none of that decaffeinated stuff that you like. That's for sure. <laughs> Just one more caution on the Spanish. <laughs> Sorry, Mike. No, no one word of caution on the Spanish. If you work too hard on a pronunciation, and you manage to get the roll or the from the back of the throat, and you start to sound as if you're using Spanish words. They will speak back to you in Spanish. That's when your shutter comes down and you go completely blank and go, ah. <laughs> yeah, that's good. This uh, uh, we question had, comes up. You've okay. had one instance as well when she went into the supermarket to look for something for the kitchen. And what did you ask for then, Yvette? A pig. She asked for a pig because kitchen and pig are very similar. Right. <laughs> yeah those are some great stories yesterday for example this happens to me quite a bit um i'm in line at the supermarket and the fellow only had two products so i let him go by and i said it to him in spanish my wife is spanish so i can speak spanish fairly well, fairly well um and he answers me in english and this happens to me a lot where a spanish person they want to use their english if they can speak it and and I'm there and I'm like, oh, but I want to use my Spanish. And so it's fun. It's a fun situation. It arises quite a bit. So, um, so this is another question from Gavin. Uh, Paul, this would be for you and Alex. He's asking, how can I be sure that if I buy a new off-plan property from a developer, that it will be completed and sold as described in the brochure? Really good question. And um and uh, I'll answer this, and, and, and hopefully Alex will will, will uh, concur. Um, so, so what, what happens when, when you buy a new property? You get a, you get a contract. Um, you you go to see the the show house or to see the property um, that's being built. Part of the contract is uh, how long it's going to take to build the property, um, and normally a, an amount of time in there that's allowed for kind of force majeure, and if there's something exceptional that would delay, um, and that's that can normally be well, it's about three months in my experience it's not normally added into there but these days that's very very rare that uh, the projects overrun in, in terms of time um, and the second part of that question uh, in terms of how do I know it'll come out like the show house like, like I've seen there's a um, part of the contract is a, is a thing called the memorandum de calidad which is a, a list of qualities which says that the, the kitchen is going to be made of silicone and we're going to use porcelain so bathrooms um the, the 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 quality of the insulation and such it actually breaks it down to quite fine detail um exactly what you're going to be getting so it's very clear on what's included and what's not included um so that's that's all laid out in advance um, before money changes hands, um, Alex. Yeah, um, Paul, I do. I do concur with that. I'd, I'd also add it's very important that you, uh, a, a, you know, an independent lawyer looks at that contract, has a good read of it, um, that the, the buyer understands it. Um, most developers uh, who've applied for planning permission will provide a bank guarantee. So I think it's very important that if you are buying off plan that you, met, you insist on the bank guarantee being provided. Um, at the same time, I'd, I'd, I'd only buy you know, through a reputable agent such as you know, Massa or from an established builder. So I'd say go and visit their show houses and go and see some of the developments that they've already built. Um, but the good news is if you've got that bank guarantee, if the builder went, um, you know, had problems in finishing the build or, or went into liquidation during the build process, you would recover those monies. So the bank guarantee is really quite important. And as Paul said, the quality spec, the memory of the Cali Valleys, that's, that's quite important as well, as well as a, you know, a good contract that protects your position as much as, um, as, much as the builders. Yeah, just, I'd just like to add to that as well. Is if, any, if, 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 uh, if you're watching this and you want to start looking at properties after and you're looking at properties, for example, on our website, before we start listing a new property, well, we went through what we do when we list a resale property, but before we start working with any builder, um, all of these things have to be in place. So we, we will check that uh, the builder is the owner of the land, that they have the right permissions, um, 
we've been we've been on the Costa Blanca since 1981, so we, we kind of know who, who who we want to work with and, and who we don't as well. So that, that that's important that local knowledge. Um, from the customer side, um, bank guarantees are absolutely mandatory for anyone that's parting with any money for a property that's that's in construction. So that will always be be in place, and we wouldn't offer anything uh, without that. Um, we'll also <laughs> you may want to believe this but we do get clients sometimes that want to try and save a few pounds and and and, and, and work without a lawyer we won't work with a client that hasn't got an independent lawyer an independent means a lawyer uh, your lawyer is different from the from the seller um so different from the builder or, or the individual so those things all have to be in place before um before we can go forward and uh, and uh, help you to to purchase your property I hope that kind of answers the question, Mike. Hey, yeah, I hope I hope that gets that done. Um, so we have uh, one more question. This one is for Alex. Uh, what fees should a buyer expect when buying a home on the Costa Blanca? Okay, so so basically, um, in the, in in Spain, and particularly in, in the Valencian region, you, you're going to pay what's known as transfer tax. That is ten percent. And if you're buying a brand new property, you pay VAT, which is also 10%. So you've got to add that to the price. But on top, for a brand new property, you'll also pay stamp duty at 1.5%. So if it's a resale, it's 10%. If it's a, it's a, if it's a new build, it's 11.5%. On top of that, you'll have notary fees and land registry fees. We're typically about anywhere between 700 and 1,200 euros, uh, depending on, on the, the cost of the, um, the property. And um, we charge just a, a flat fee uh, for all master clients of 1,500 euros plus EVA, which is VAT, which is 21% here, 21% uh, on buying products and services, but 10% on buying properties. So don't get, don't get confused, those two different rates for that. So on, on average, Paul, I'd say if you're buying a brand new property, up to 15% and secondhand, 13, 14%. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I would say that's 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 about right. That's what I normally I normally tell people to budget up to fifteen percent because it's nice to come out with a bit <coughs> a bit extra as well. And there's normally some change to be had. Um, I always advise clients budget fifteen percent. Then there's usually enough money to to left over to arrange things like buildings and contest insurance for your property, uh, Spanish will, which um, I, I, I think is very important. And and uh, I guess you 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 can arrange all of that as well, Alex. Right. Yeah, absolutely. We, you know, I'd always recommend having a Spanish will for Spanish assets. And then if you've still got UK assets, have a, have a UK will for that. Um, so we, we've actually just launched a new website called www.yourspanishwill.com. So, you know, have a look at that. And on there, you can, you can, you can, you can have a look at the importance of having a will. And also we put on there uh, having a lasting power of attorney. So if you, if you started to lose mobility or, um, you know, um, you know, early signs of dementia, you can put in place a power of attorney, which you give, you, you grant in favor of a trusted person and they can manage your affairs for you if you, if you become unable to do so. And also a letter of, a letter of wishes for kind of personal items. So, so yeah, definitely I'd have a, have a Spanish will and all Spanish wills are signed normally before a notary. So um, as soon as you've completed the property purchase, which is again, is before a notary, I'd recommend that you sign a Spanish will. Lots of people nowadays don't actually come out for completion. They grant us a power of attorney. With that power of attorney, we apply, we apply for the, the NIAs, open a bank account to complete the purchase and register the properties in the name. But as soon as they can come out, um, shortly after the purchase, we, we would certainly recommend an, another visit to the notary and putting in place that Spanish will call. Great, thanks very much for that, Alex. Um, just while we're talking about things when we're coming towards completions and, and purchasing, um, Robbie, I wanted to ask you um, about fixing. We have a lot of clients that ask us about, you know, can they lock in an exchange? How, how does that work? Um, and, and why is that something that, that might be worth considering? Uh, yeah, absolutely. That's uh, a good question. Um, I mean, typically, if you're buying a property, uh, you'll need to transfer some money for a deposit. Uh, and then in perhaps four to 12 weeks, as you were discussing, you'll have a completion payment to make. Uh, or if you're buying off plan, uh, buying a new build, you might have a, a set of stage payments to make over, uh, over a number of months. Um, 
So the, the, one of the main mistakes people sometimes make is just to pay for each payment as they come along and not really worry about what the, the exchange rate's doing. Meanwhile, and of course, when you, you stop and think about that, you're actually then buying a property in Spain without knowing how much it's going to cost you. Um, and if someone said to you, if you're buying a property in the UK, but I don't know what the price is, you, you wouldn't buy it. So we always uh, suggest that people consider fixing their exchange rates for future payments. Um, and that means you can basically using the rate at the time of your deposit, you can fix an exchange rate for your completion payment, for any stage payments uh, and any future requirements uh, that you may have. Um, obviously the benefit to that is you then have a fixed cost in sterling for each of those payments. So you know in advance what that amount of euros is going to cost you in four weeks, 12 weeks, six months, whatever it may be. Um, and you have that peace of mind of knowing that the exchange rate won't fall and give you a nasty surprise, which can be a very nasty surprise if, uh, if you don't do it, as we've seen over recent weeks. Um, flip side to that, of course, is if the rate goes up in the meantime and you've fixed your rate, then you'll regret doing it to some extent and say, I wish we just left it to the last minute. Um, but there's no magic way to guarantee getting the best exchange rate. And I think when you're buying a property and making a move, probably only doing it once it is a once in a lifetime move unless you're very lucky and you're buying multiple properties uh, but for most people it's it's a lifestyle move not a, a playing the financial markets and trying to speculate on currency so we always try and give those options to people sometimes people say well i've got plenty of budget i don't care if the rate drops fine but it's always worth considering at the outset what the implications might be of that exchange rate moving for or against you and using a currency broker uh, you can have that conversation, you can manage it and, and make sure that you know what risk you're taking with exchange rates. Um, so mostly fixing a rate is, is the safest way to do it. You know where you are, you know where you stand. Uh, and it's good to understand if you don't fix your exchange rates in advance, what that impact might be on your budget, and just to talk through the figures to, to ensure you know what you're doing either way. And for example, if, if somebody wanted to fix, they needed 150,000 euros, for example, and they want to fix a rate for the uh, say it's a property is going to be ready in six months time um money has to change hands is it you have to pay some kind of deposit to, to fix that how, how does that work yeah that's true so we would typically ask for a 10 percent deposit so if you were sending a hundred thousand sterling in three six months time whatever date uh, that, that we agreed uh we would ask you for for a ten thousand pound deposit and then the ninety thousand pound balance at the time that you want your currency to to be sent uh, that can be reduced in some circumstances. If you're not fixing for, for very long, we can sometimes reduce that down to near a 5%. Uh, but we do need a deposit to fix a rate um, so that that actually secures the rate and the amount that you're looking at and, and indeed the date um, that you're, you're fixing to. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, after this webinar is finished i'm going to send uh, your details robin i'm going to in fact to, to everyone watching i'm going to send an email to you and uh, i'm going to link up uh, robin and the place in the sun currencies so if you want to get in touch with them to, to get more information or talk about rates and, and start planning for that that might be be an idea same with alex as well um i'll uh, i'll send those details through to yourself uh of, of alex um and uh also Howard's uh, wonderful uh, yoga school, which you're part of. So if, you, if you're coming down to the area, I, I, I will uh, send you some details so you can go and pay Howard a visit. Uh, and uh, I'll also give you some information about uh, Yvette and Mike's activities as well, in case you want to go and watch the uh, Al Gorfa's Ronaldo. Uh, I'll certainly do that, that for you. Um, so we're coming to, to towards the end of the the webinar now um we've had lots of questions come in so i'm just going to head right into the q a time now i'm not sure we're going to get them all done but let's let's have a go um i'm reading these on the hop so i, I will read them out and field them to uh, the right person perhaps okay so um i've had a a question in from christopher this is one for you alex um can you clarify the income figure? What kind of income does it have to be? I think that's in terms of perhaps um, gaining residency. Um, is, it only, is it only employment income that's considered? 
Uh, and how about if I were to buy one or two modest properties, could I use the projected rental income to fulfill the income requirements? Okay, so, so basically, um, it much depends on whether you've, you've retired or not. Um, and if you are working here, for example, you're gonna rent out your property, then you can actually register as a self-employed person and you would pay self social security fees on a, on a monthly basis. They start off at 50 euros. So, um, you know, depending whether you're 65 or uh, you know, uh, under or, or over, if you're a pensioner, then you've got to show, um, basically they're looking, they're looking at between 800 and 850 euros a month going into your bank account for three months before the resident, uh, residency application. And they want to see 9,000 euros per adult uh, on there. I've seen some other questions about whether a 12 month rental contract will do or a per property purchase. Yes, it has to be a 12 month uh, rental contract. Uh, if you are taking out a rental contract, then I'd say, you know, maybe a break clause because lots of people, Paul, as you know, come out, rent and then buy somewhere, which is um, something that they do. So, so if you're going to rent, you know, do that. If you can buy even better. Um, but basically, yeah, the, the, the income will vary depending on whether you're employed or a pensioner. And they'll want to see that income coming in for three months before the application. And if you haven't got it in your bank account, um, then they'll, they'll want to see a, a UK bank accounts as well. Thank you, Alex. Um, okay, so I'm gonna take the next one. Uh, this is from Steve, uh, who's asked the question, would you recommend buying a new or resale property? Well, I guess I should answer that one. Um, I think the most important thing is that you find the right spot that you want to be in, whether it's a new or a resale property, I think is secondary to finding the, 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 the right location. Um, and, and that's where, we can work together, you know, from, from, from this kind of moment in, you know, and I get a good understanding of what's important to you, what kind of environment you, you want around you. Um, and we can even start to plan to, to head out to Spain and uh, myself and my colleagues can, can show you around the area um, on our viewing trips. Again, I'm going to send some details of that after the, after the webinar is finished. Um, but yeah, we're going to be more area led really rather, rather than property led. We, we have new properties, we have resale properties, we have prop new properties that are ready now, new properties that are ready in the future. Um, but definitely we've got to be area led first because you don't need a house in Spain until you find a place, uh, a location that you actually want to spend the rest of your life in, or at least a, a, a great, a great part of your life in. Um, so hopefully that answers your question, Steve. Um, uh, question in from, uh, from Mims. Uh, if deciding on planning to make your move next year, post Brexit, can you apply for NIE? Uh, uh, slash residency in advance and before the deadline this year uh, and, uh, and that one's back to you Alex. Yes so j j j just for people watching this aware we, we've set up a website called getspanishresidency.com so some of these questions that you're asking are on there but certainly yes Mimsy you can apply for an NIE now you can apply for residency now as well you'll obtain it this year the residency process is, is quite can be quite quick, especially with new applications uh, since some changes that were introduced by the Spanish authorities on the 6th of July. So we can apply for it online now, and then at some stage you'll have to come out. But you have to prove that you've got medical insurance in, in place or Form S1 if you're retired, sufficient income, and that you've got at least a 12-month contract or you, you've bought a property. Great stuff. Thank you, Alex. Okay, going to pick the next one. Uh, this is from Chris. Hi, Paul. Is it easy to become self-employed and do you receive health care with tax payments? Uh, P.S. We are both under 50. So uh, self-employed um, uh, or in Spain, that's that's known as uh, autonomo that you pay. Um, uh, why don't I send this one to Mike? Because I believe you are autonomo. So tell us, uh, how did you go about doing that? Um, and then perhaps, Alex, you could ask answer the uh, healthcare uh, part of that. So, Mike. Hey, yeah, so um, Autonomo is pretty, pretty simple to set up. I think if you are going to come down and work here on your own sort of business as an Autonomo, you want to have a, a lawyer and a good uh, accountant. Um, and I think my experience setting up what we do here, uh, I could echo a lot of what Yvette and Mike and Howard shared earlier. You know, when you come down, you're going to start to network, you're gonna to start to meet people. 
Um, certainly that was the biggest thing for us um, was just getting, getting out there and uh, getting a community. Um, I think Yvette and Mike's story uh, was pretty, um, pretty much what, what, what ours was. It, I don't think it was as easy. It sounds like you guys were quite natural at what you did. Um, you know, we had to press on for a few years to, to build up a network. Uh, and it also depends on what business you're going to do. If you're bringing, um, you know, a remote work here to Spain and you're going to start remote working um, to, with contracts outside of Spain or even within Spain or whatever, um, obviously that's a lot easier. So, but if you're coming down, yeah, you're going to start meeting people. If you're going to set up a business, you're going to, if it's a service business within an area, you know, you're going to start to meet people in the area that you live. Um, again, like, uh, you know, Howard and June's experience. Hi, June. I think you just showed up there. And so, um, yeah, I think that's really about it. I would certainly pass it off to Alex with respect to the healthcare, although, you know, we're paying our autonomo. We've been living here. We have our healthcare and everything. And it's just fine. So. Yeah, th thanks, Mike. Yeah, but basically, once someone registers to apply for an autonomo, which is um, something, again, we, we do for clients, they, it's an online process. Then, then we set them up and they, um, they pay, it starts off with the first six months, 50 euros a month, and that does include healthcare. So they can plug into the Spanish healthcare system by doing that. Um, most people will take out private medical as well on top of that. Uh, private medical care, depending on your age, et cetera, it is, is quite reasonable. Um, and you tend to kind of get appointments quicker, but the Spanish healthcare system is, is very good indeed. So, so yeah, being an autonomo means you can access the healthcare system and you can have beneficiaries on there. So you can have members of your family on there too. Great, thank you very much for that. Okay, I'm gonna pick another, another couple. There's so many here, I wanna get through them all. We're not gonna get through them all, but I promise you that all questions will be answered in, in the follow-up uh, and we'll get back to you individually on those, but just gonna try and run a couple more here. Um, so I've got, uh, well, this one's from me, it's from Becky. Uh, what happens on a viewing trip and when do they run? Um, well, we have daily departures now. So a, view, a viewing trip, in case you're not sure, is we organize a four-night slash five-day trip to the Costa Blanca um, where essentially we work to your brief. Um, we, we, we tailor make it. It's all individual. It's not sort of a big bus. It's just, it's just yourselves and either myself or one, one of my colleagues in Spain who will uh, give you access to the different locations that could possibly work for you and we also access the market in terms of properties and line up the best that's available uh, that meets your your requirements um, and so so in terms of when do we organize and run the year round really we stop at then over christmas and, and, and easter but other than that the year round whilst we're allowed to travel that is um, and, and it's something that uh, it has been designed really just to take all the hassle out of, of, of going to Spain by yourself and perhaps having to meet up with loads of different agents and loads of different people. We, we if you like, pull it all together in, in, in one trip um, and allow enough time also to do things like, you know, meet some locals, meet, meet, meet people like Yvette and Mike and, and, and Howard and June. I, I, I know we've stop but i've stopped by your, your places before with for coffees and such and I, I think that's a really important part of the viewing trip to kind of introduce you introduce a potential uh, mover to spain or a buyer of a property in spain to to, to the people who live there uh, of course we make time if you want to speak to for example lawyers while you're there as well um so in addition to sort of just property viewings it's it's a it's a chance to understand what the life is is like there and and that's a trip that i would suggest that you make you know once you are in the market because we put in an awful lot of work to actually pull in the right properties um so once you are in the market that's the time to come on your viewing trip and uh, and we'll help you find property the, the cost depends on the time of year if we're talking sort of august um it's uh, we're doing that for 129 pounds and we and we, and we do a, we do a package where it's the flight. Uh, you come and stay in our hotel. We have our own hotel in just outside Torrevieja called the Hotel Massa. Uh, so come and stay with us uh, for, for four nights. We, we pick you up at the airport. All of your um, transport is arranged. Um, works a bit like Place in the Sun, but with no cameras and, and, and less attractive staff, perhaps. Um, but it's a similar, similar type, type scenario. So, yeah, highly recommend it when, when you get to that 
that point. So uh, I hope that's answered your question, Becky. Um, right, let me grab... Um, let's just hit, see if we can get two more questions in. Um, this is for Alex. Um, Steve has asked, are, are you saying that Spanish charge capital gains tax on primary residents? Perhaps there might be a bit of misunderstanding, something that you... You said before so yeah just, just just bear in mind when you apply for residence in spain if you um you, you apply for residence and you've got to give an address so it's either property that you've purchased or a property that you're renting if you still own a property in the uk and you that you sell that after becoming uh, a resident then the spanish tax authorities will tax you on that even though it was your main residence because they will actually consider your main residence to be your your property in spain so that's why I said it's very important to you know plan your move carefully, plan your residency carefully. But you, you know this year because you know there's less than six months left in 2020, you can move to Spain this year. You can sell UK property. You can become a resident this year in Spain, and you won't get taxed on the sale of your UK property in Spain. Okay, and this is the last question. I'm afraid this one's for you, Alex. There's lots of questions about this. Um, how long does it take to obtain residencia, and is there enough time left before the end of the year? That's a question from Lisa. Okay, so, so there is certainly enough time to apply for and obtain residency this year. You know, again, have a look at our website, www.getspanishresidency.com. Um, it's important to put in place. Um, you know, have the rental contract, have the property available, open up the bank accounts, that all takes time. So I, I, I'd allow, you know, up to between a month and three months to apply for the residency. But what's really important, Paul, is that British people arriving in Spain who want to apply for residency have until the end of December to do so. OK, but you, what, what, what happens then if their residency application is not complete, it could get rejected and they'll only have 10 days to respond. So I would suggest, you know, line up all your ducks, get them all ready, get all the paperwork together, your NIEs, property purchase or rental, money in the bank, healthcare, private healthcare if you're under the age of 65, under the, over the age of 65 form, so on. So get everything ready and, and, and start applying now, yeah. And, and you do this service, right? So you can pull all that together for someone that's buying a property and, and what kind of costs is involved in-, in, in so, so basically we, we, we just charge a, a flat fee of 315 euros per person, but all the fees are set out on our, on our website. And then if we need to go uh, in person, you know, more than once or twice, then we, we charge an additional fee for that. Because basically you've got to remember, uh, we, we've got our office in La Zenia and Fulgencio, and then there's people applying all over Spain um you know us brits travel everywhere so we um we, if, if we can't travel and be there with you then we'll send a translator to accompany you but for example we obtained residency with someone recently in, in murcia we were on the phone they walked into the office uh, of the you know the, the, the police the police uh, um officer who gave them the residency on that day and we were there on hand so we will we'll definitely help you guide guide every, anyone through the residency process and get help them get the residency this year or even next year Thank you very much. Um, right, so as I said earlier, there's loads more questions, um, but time's up, we've overrun now. Um, but I am going to make sure that uh, between myself, Alex and Robin, um, and perhaps Mike as well, that, that, that we get back to you and we'll answer every question um, that, that hasn't been covered today. And so keep an eye on your inbox because uh, we'll, we'll be in touch with you shortly after the webinar. Um, so that just leaves me to, to, to thank all of you guys, Howard and, and June. Hi, June. Thanks, thanks, for, thanks for making it in. That's great that you made it. Uh, thanks, Yvette and Mike, uh, for joining. Um, really looking forward to seeing you guys in Spain really soon. Uh, Robin, for, for that great tips on, on currency and uh, saving, saving, or you guys lots of money when you when you buy your property uh, and Mike uh, for that inside information on uh, on the uh, local autonomo in, in Spain and of course Alex um, thank you so much big subject and uh, and I think you you answered very well so uh, that's it I hope that was useful um, do get in touch anything we can do for you anytime uh, so keep an eye out in your inbox now and we'll be in touch and look forward to welcoming you to spain very soon so over and out thanks very much take care guys thanks paul thank you everyone thank you paul bye bye bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.